being or the universe or how you would formulate it of substance, it would be that the the division or the split itself is in a way uh, the closest we come to a fundamental principle or oh yes the, definitely there's no there's no fundamental principle that there's no fundamental one from which anything would follow uh, I think mm, this would take more time but one, one can take passages in, in this in this preface where, where I think Hegel puts it absolutely brilliantly that the when he refers to the ancient atomism as the principle of one etc the one who actually invented in a way the decomposition of all possible entities into atoms which are which can be counted for one which is sort of you know the imposition of countability of of unit upon the multiple faces of universe and what hegel says there is that the moment they invented the one as an indivisible particle particle they also had to invent the void which separates the mm. the particles and we actually have to look at the basic unity not as either the one or the void, but the split into the one and the void. So what is indivisible is division itself. I think this is, this is the bottom line of, of Hegel's argument about uh, substance's subject. And there's always this idea in Hegel that in the beginning you have uh, some a spiritual identity or whatever, which is then alienated from itself, it splits, and then, in the end, it is recuperated, the split is recuperated, it again adds up to this self-identity. But the thing is, there is, no addition, uh, uh, there is no initial entity which would precede the split itself. You always have a, a sort of retroactive illusion that you have an in itself which was a pure in itself, but which actually only became in itself by it becoming its other, by it being split. So the very notion of spirit, which is supposed to be lost and found again, is produced only through the split. It doesn't pre-exist the split. It's only on by it being split and alienated that it becomes spirit at all. So it makes no sense to recuperate something which wasn't there in the beginning. And I think one one of one way of again of, to propose a handy formula is in that in Hegel, what was what you lose the 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 initial in itself or the initial unity or the initial uh, thesis or whatever. But I think what what sums up Hegel's procedure is that what was lost was never possessed. You lose something, but you didn't. You never possessed it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the illusion, the, the retroactive illusion, is that you possess something and then you lost it. You got split and alienated, whatever. This is absolutely the retroactive illusion. You didn't have it in the first place. I mean, you can only reconstruct the supposition that you had this plenitude of being, this access to truth, this access to absolute in the beginning, and then it had to sort of got, you know, the origin had to be split. Uh, lost, um, there's a fall, there's, you know, there's some sort of the Christian idea of the fall. In the beginning, there was some sort of plenitude, there is a fall. I think the whole Hegelian argument is against this idea. The origin is absolutely empty. There is nothing in the origin. There, there, there is no origin. I mean, everything is created on the way. So this empty origin, once it gets split, you only have the idea that, that you have some sort of original plenitude. There's no original planet. This is absolutely not the metaphysics of origin. I mean, the, this is one of the Derrida's formulas, the metaphysics of origin, and then the, the supplement, which then screws up this origin, etc. So Hegel is absolutely not that. I mean, he always says the origin is the emptiest point there is. There's no plenitude in the origin. Everything is gained only through the negativity, through the labor of negativity on the way. You produce this entity. Uh, which is supposed to be owned in the beginning, but so what? What is lost was never possessed. I think this is a good formula. Phenomenology of Spirit, written by G. W. F. Hegel, translated by A. V. Miller, narrated by David Devries. Preface on scientific cognition. 1. 
It is customary to preface a work with an explanation of the author's aim, why he wrote the book, and the relationship in which he believes it to stand to other earlier or contemporary treatises on the same subject. In the case of a philosophical work, however, such an explanation seems not only superfluous, but, in view of the nature of the subject matter, even inappropriate and misleading. For whatever might appropriately be said about philosophy in a preface, say, a historical statement of the main drift and the point of view, the general content and results, a string of random assertions and assurances about truth, none of this can be accepted as the way in which to expound philosophical truth. Also, since philosophy moves essentially in the element of universality, which includes within itself the particular, it might seem that here, more than in any of the other sciences, the subject matter itself, and even in its complete nature, were expressed in the aim and the final results, the execution being by contrast really the unessential factor. On the other hand, in the ordinary view of anatomy, for instance, say, the knowledge of the parts of the body regarded as inanimate, we are quite sure that we do not as yet possess the subject matter itself, the content of this science, but must, in addition, exert ourselves to know the particulars. Further, in the case of such an aggregate of information, which has no right to bear the name of science, an opening talk about aim and other such generalities is usually conducted in the same historical and uncomprehending way in which the content itself, these nerves, muscles, etc., is spoken of. In the case of philosophy, on the other hand, this would give rise to the incongruity that along with the employment of such a method, its inability to grasp the truth would also be demonstrated. 2. Furthermore, the very attempt to define how a philosophical work is supposed to be connected with other efforts to deal with the same subject matter drags in an extraneous concern, and what is really important for the cognition of the truth is obscured. The more conventional opinion gets fixated on the antithesis of truth and falsity, the more it tends to expect a given philosophical system to be either accepted or contradicted and hence it finds only acceptance or rejection. It does not comprehend the diversity of philosophical systems as the progressive unfolding of truth, but rather sees in it simple disagreements. The bud disappears in the bursting forth of the blossom, and one might say that the former is refuted by the latter. Similarly, when the fruit appears, the blossom is shown up in its turn as a false manifestation of the plant and the fruit now emerges as the truth of it instead. These forms are not just distinguished from one another, they also supplant one another as mutually incompatible. Yet at the same time, their fluid nature makes elements of an organic unity in which they not only do not conflict, but in which each is as necessary as the other, and this mutual necessity alone constitutes the life of the whole. But he who rejects a philosophical system, i.e., the new philosopher, does not usually comprehend what he is doing in this way. And he who grasps the contradiction between them, i.e., the historian of philosophy, does not, as a general rule, know how to free it from its one sidedness, or maintain it in its freedom by recognizing the reciprocally necessary moments that take shape as a conflict and seeming incompatibility. 3. Demanding and supplying these superficial explanations passes readily enough as a concern with what is essential. Where could the inner meaning of a philosophical work find fuller expression than in its aims and results, and how could these be more exactly known than by distinguishing them from everything else the age brings forth in this sphere? Yet when this activity is taken for more than the mere beginnings of cognition, when it is allowed to pass for actual cognition, then it should be reckoned as no more than a device for evading the real issue, die Sache selbst, a way of creating an impression of hard work and serious commitment to the problem, while actually sparing oneself both. For the real issue is not exhausted by stating it as an aim, but by carrying it out, nor is the result the actual whole but rather the result together with the process through which it came about. 
The aim by itself is a lifeless universal, just as the tendency is a mere drive that as yet lacks an act existence. And the bare result is the corpse which has left the guiding tendency behind it. Similarly, the specific difference of a thing is rather its limit. It is where the thing stops, or it is what the thing is not. This concern with aim or results, with differentiating and passing judgment on various thinkers, is therefore an easier task than it might seem. For instead of getting involved in the real issue, this kind of activity is always away beyond it. Instead of tarrying with it and losing itself in it, this kind of knowing is forever grasping at something new. It remains essentially preoccupied with itself instead of being preoccupied with the real issue and surrendering to it. To judge a thing that has substance and solid worth is quite easy. To comprehend it is much harder. And to blend judgment and comprehension in a definitive description is the hardest thing of all. 4. Culture and its laborious emergence from the immediacy of substantial life must always begin by getting acquainted with general principles and points of view, so as at first to work up to a general conception, gadunka, of the real issue, as well as learning to support and refute the general conception with reasons, then to apprehend the rich and concrete abundance of life by differential classification, and finally, to give accurate instruction and pass serious speculative effort. This kind of knowing and judging will still retain its appropriate place in ordinary conversation. 5. The true shape in which truth exists can only be the scientific system of such truth. To help bring philosophy closer to the form of science, to the goal where it can lay aside the title love of knowing and be actual knowing, that is what I have set myself to do. The inner necessity that knowing should be science lies in its nature, and only the systematic exposition of philosophy itself provides it. But the external necessity, so far as it is grasped in a general way, setting aside accidental matters of person and motivation, is the same as the inner, or in other words, it lies in the shape in which time sets forth the sequential existence of its moments. To show that now is the time for philosophy to be raised to the status of a science would therefore be the only true justification of any effort that has this aim, for to do so would demonstrate the necessity of the aim, would indeed at the same time be the accomplishing of it. 6. To lay down that the true shape of truth, though it must for the present be no more than a bare assertion, like the view that it contradicts. If, namely, the true exists only in what, or better, as what, is sometimes called intuition, sometimes immediate knowledge of the absolute, religion, or being, not at the center of divine love, but the being of the divine love itself, then what is required in the exposition of philosophy is, from this viewpoint, rather the opposite of the form of the notion. For the absolute is not supposed to be comprehended, it is to be felt and intuited. Not the notion of the absolute, but the feeling and intuition of it must govern what is said, and must be expressed by it. 7. If we apprehend a demand of this kind in its broader context, and view it as it appears at the stage which self-conscious spirit has presently reached, it is clear that spirit has now got beyond the substantial life it formerly led in the element of thought that it is beyond the immediacy of faith, beyond the satisfaction and security of the certainty that consciousness then had of its reconciliation with the essential being and of that being's universal presence both within and without. It has not only gone beyond all this into the other extreme of an insubstantial reflection of itself into itself, but beyond that too. Spirit has not only lost its essential life, it is also conscious of this loss and of the finitude that is its own content. Turning away from the empty husks and confessing that it lies in wickedness, it reviles itself for so doing, and now demands from philosophy not so much knowledge of what it is as the recovery through its agency 
of that lost sense of solid and substantial being. Philosophy is to meet this need, not by opening up the fast-locked nature of substance and raising this to self-consciousness, not by bringing consciousness out of its chaos back to an order based on thought, nor to the simplicity of the notion, but rather by running together what thought has put asunder, by suppressing the differentiations of the notion and restoring the feeling of essential being. In short, by providing edification rather than insight. The beautiful, the holy, the eternal, religion and love are the bait required to arouse the desire to bite, not the notion, but ecstasy, not the cold march of necessity in the thing itself, but the ferment of enthusiasm. These are supposed to be what sustains and continually extends the wealth of substance. 8. In keeping with this demand is the strenuous, almost overzealous and frenzied effort to tear men away from their preoccupation with the sensuous, from their ordinary, private, einzelne affairs, and to direct their gaze to the stars, as if they had forgotten all about the divine and were ready like worms to content themselves with dirt and water. Formerly they had a heaven adorned with a vast wealth of thoughts and imagery. The meaning of all that is hung on the thread of light by which it was linked to that heaven. Instead of dwelling in this world's presence, man looked beyond it, following this thread to an otherworldly presence, so to speak. The eye of the spirit had to be forcibly turned and held fast to the things of this world, and it has taken a long time before the lucidity which only heavenly things used to have could penetrate the dullness and confusion in which the sense of worldly things was enveloped, and so make attention to the here and now as such, attention to what has been called experience, an interesting and valid enterprise. Now we seem to need just the opposite. Sense is so fast rooted in earthly things that it requires just as much force to raise it. The spirit shows itself as so impoverished that like a wanderer in the desert craving for a mere mouthful of water, it seems to crave for its refreshment only the bare feeling of the divine in general. By the little which now satisfies spirit, we can measure the extent of its loss. 9. This modest complacency in receiving, or this sparingness in giving, does not, however, befit science. Whoever seeks mere edification, and whoever wants to shroud